And thank you, Doron, and thank you always for everything you do to make the National Library of Israel's reading room possible. It's really great. <clears throat> it is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Nora Gold. Dr. Gold is a prize-winning author of three books of fiction and the founder and editor of the prestigious online literary journal, jewishfiction.net, now celebrating its 10th anniversary year. Jewishfiction.net has published over 450 works of fiction, originally written in English or translated into English from 15 languages. It has readers in 140 countries. I first met Dr. Gold many years ago in her capacity as a Canadian Jewish leader. She co-founded three Zionist organizations and is a citizen of both Israel and Canada. We re-met more recently around her innovative literary work. Dr. Gold is an author whose books have received recognition and honors. Her first book, Marrow and Other Stories, won a Canadian Jewish Book Award. Fields of Exile, which was the first novel about anti-Israelism on campus, won a Canadian Jewish Literary Award. Her most recent novel, The Dead Man, was awarded a translation grant from Canada Council for the Arts and was published in Hebrew as Haish Hamit in 2019. All her books are, of course, in our library here at the National Library of Israel. Dr. Gold spent 10 years as a tenured professor at McMaster University, followed by almost two decades at the Center for Women's Studies at OISE University of Toronto as an associate scholar and then a writer in residence. And now it is my great honor to introduce Dr. Nora Gold. Thank you very much, Naomi, for this lovely introduction and for inviting me to give this talk. Thanks also to the wonderful National Library of Israel. It's a great honor to be here. And thanks to everyone who has joined us, including some of the authors and translators of the works I'll be discussing. Today, I'm going to speak about Jewish fiction and some ways that it reflects Jewish life across time and place. I'll start by speaking briefly about what Jewish fiction is. Then I'll give you a bird's eye view of 16 of the stories in jewishfiction.net that were originally written in 16 different languages. And I'll discuss some key themes that emerge from them. I'll conclude with some comments on the relationship between fiction and real life. All 16 of the authors whose stories I'll be mentioning have books in the National Library of Israel. For those of you not yet familiar with our journal, we are the only English language journal, either print, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> or online, <clears throat> devoted exclusively to publishing Jewish fiction. On the bottom left here, you can see our logo <clears throat> and our address is www.jewishfiction.net. We publish works of fiction that were either written in English or translated into English from 15 languages, as you heard. And actually, we just accepted our first story in Czech. So in our Rosh Hashanah issue, that'll be our 16th translated language, making it 17 with English. And just one more, and we'll be at 18, which is Chai. Jewishfiction.net is completely independent of any organization or funder, and we rely entirely on donations from our readers. We're very grateful that with their support and our ability to provide tax receipts for American and Canadian donations, we can keep this journal free of charge and therefore accessible to everyone regardless of income. Our current issue is always available to everyone and to read all 460 stories in our archive, all you have to do is enter an email and password. I started jewishfiction.net because the advent of digital technology about 15 years ago began making it harder for many writers to get their work published, especially if their writing was niche market as Jewish fiction is usually considered. I became concerned about some of the fine Jewish writers I knew who couldn't find a home for their work. So jewishfiction.net was created to make a space for first rate Jewish fiction 
by authors who are not yet well known. I also created jewishfiction.net out of concern over the increasing polarization within the Jewish world. For example, between left and right, religious and secular, Israel and the diaspora, and more. I wanted there to be a place where all Jewish voices could be heard, where readers could encounter in one place first-rate Jewish fiction from around the world and experience the rich diversity that exists within Jewish culture, and at the same time, the core elements that unite us. So JewishFiction.net is very inclusive and features stories by writers of all backgrounds, perspectives, and orientations. In each issue, we just put out our 27th, we publish a mixture of new writers alongside those who are already well established. For example, we have published such eminent authors as Elie Wiesel, Aaron Appelfeld, Chava Rosenfarb, Aleph Beit Yoshua, Tova Mervis, Steve Stern, and Nava Semel, to name just a few. In addition to new stories or novel excerpts, we publish new translations of classic works. For example, we've published new translations of work by Agnon, Mendele Mohar Sforim, and Isaac Babel. JewishFiction.net has a distinguished advisory council and a brilliant team of volunteers with reviewer hubs in three countries, and these are currently located in Jerusalem, Houston, and Toronto. Without all our amazing reviewers over these first 10 years, this journal could not have been produced. So my deep gratitude to all of them, and a special thanks to our current reviewers, Sheila Deutsch, Julia Mezo, Bernice Heilbrunn, Charlotte Berkowitz, and Carol Ricker. Let's start by defining Jewish fiction. The question, what is Jewish fiction, has been written about and struggled with in hundreds, maybe thousands of articles, essays, and books, many of which I have read. Perhaps it's easiest to start answering this question by defining what Jewish fiction is not. Here's an example of what I do not consider Jewish fiction. A few years ago, a Jewish woman I know saw that I had published a story in an American Jewish publication, and she told me she wanted to get something in there too. She was born Jewish, but had no real connection to or interest in Jewish matters. She had written something a few months before about a woman walking down the street, eating a donut and reminiscing about a love relationship that had ended badly. So this woman took this piece she'd written and changed the street name in it from one of the main downtown streets in Toronto to the name of one that once was a main street of Toronto's Shmata district and which for Toronto Jews would resonate as a Jewish neighborhood. Then she gave the character an identifiably Jewish name and changed the donut in her piece to a salami sandwich and she got this piece into that Jewish journal. I was happy for her getting published but I thought to myself, this is not a Jewish story and I still think this. I do not adhere to what I think of as culinary Judaism. Throw in a blintz and it's a Jewish story. And at jewishfiction.net, we would never publish a story like that. As this example illustrates, it is not enough for a writer to be Jewish for their work to be considered Jewish fiction. In fact, one does not need to be Jewish to write Jewish fiction. So if the defining characteristic of Jewish fiction is not its authorship, then what is it? Out of all the different definitions of Jewish fiction I've come across over the years, the one that I think still holds up best is Ruth Weiss's, which she presented in her book, The Modern Jewish Canon. It has its limitations inevitably, some of which Weiss herself acknowledges, such as her inclusion in her proposed canon, only works by Ashkenazi authors. Other limitations of her perspective have been articulated by other scholars, including contributors to the book Arguing the Modern Jewish Canon, a festschrift dedicated to Weiss herself. Still, I agree with Weiss's definition that Jewish literature is literature that is, quote, centrally Jewish, a phrase coined by Cynthia Ozick that Weiss quotes. To Weiss, centrally Jewish means reflective in some way of Jewish experience, Jewish consciousness, or the Jewish condition. She offers as examples of Jewish experience a novel by Isaac Besheva Singer, describing a 17th century Polish town in the grip of messianic fever that, according to Weiss, plunges us into the Jewish condition. 
Or another example, when Yosef Chaim Brenner situated his novel among the Jews of Palestine before World War I. Her example of fiction that yokes us to a Jewish consciousness is Isaac Babel's Red Cavalry, which I am honored to say is one of the stories we've published in a new translation and which I'll be telling you about soon as one of the 16 stories. Another of Weiss's examples of Jewish consciousness is Agnon's fiction, where, quote, all the layers of Jewish civilization and learning surface through quotations, allusions, and stylistic imitation in Agnon's richly intertextual Hebrew. To Weiss, in Jewish fiction, either the authors or the characters know and let the reader know that they are Jews. Of course, what it means for a work of fiction to illustrate or exemplify the Jewish condition, experience, or consciousness can be complex to define. For me, a story that is Jewish expresses Jewish identity on either a religious or cultural dimension, and it relates in a fundamental way to Jewish experience, whether in the past, present, or future. Furthermore, with Jewish fiction, there is always a sense that the characters not only have Jewish ancestry or affiliation, but that they share in the fate of the Jewish people. In these works, the Jewishness of the work is inextricable. You can't pull it out or separate it like a blintz or a salami sandwich and still leave the story standing. An example of this, which in fact Ruth Weiss wrote an essay about in Mosaic magazine, is my own novel, Fields of Exile, about anti-Israelism and anti-Semitism on campus, which deals with a major contemporary concern for many Jews, that is the delegitimization of Israel and the international community, including the academe. Fields of Exile is a book that if you extract the Jewish content, there is nothing left. So this is how I think about Jewish fiction. Of course, when running a literary journal like jewishfiction.net, the question, what is Jewish fiction, which to many people is theoretical, is not theoretical to us at all. It is the bread and butter of our work. It is essential to our decision-making process. Sometimes one of our manuscript reviewers evaluating a story they've just read will say, it's a good story, but I don't see anything Jewish about it. And that, of course, is the kiss of death for that submission. It doesn't matter how interesting or well-written the story is, if it is not a Jewish story, we will not publish it. One characteristic of Jewish fiction that sets it apart from other peoples is that other peoples write in their own languages. Italians write in Italian, the French write in French, etc. Jews have Ladino, Yiddish, and Hebrew, of course. However, because of our history being scattered among the nations, we write our stories in many other languages as well. Yet quite a few Jews, especially those whose native language is English, seem unaware of this. When they hear the phrase Jewish fiction, they tend to think only of American Jewish fiction, not even other English language fiction like Canadian, British, or Australian, all of which we have published. They may know something also about Jewish fiction written in Hebrew, Yiddish, or Ladino, but not the full range of what exists in Jewish writing from around the world. So one of the goals of JewishFiction.net is to remedy that. In this spirit, I'm now going to tell you about 16 of the stories or novel excerpts that we've published, one from each language. Obviously, time will not permit me examining any of them in depth. I'll just provide a brief summary of each story to give you the flavor of it, and I'll identify its main themes. Needless to say, I am not implying that each story is representative in any way of the literature of the language in which it is written. For instance, I do not imply that the Italian language story we'll discuss is typical or representative of Italian Jewish fiction in general. Also, please note as we move through these, through these stories, and I use the word story here to include novel excerpts, that regarding each of these languages, it would be possible to discuss the Jewish fiction written in this language as a field unto itself. For example, Yiddish fiction is its own complete field of study. So is Hebrew fiction. Ditto for Russian Jewish fiction, South American Jewish fiction, etc. 
Furthermore, the writers of all the different types of Jewish fiction are diverse, not only linguistically and culturally, but in multiple other ways, in political orientation, sexual orientation, birth religion, skin color, and more. So while it is possible to make general remarks about Jewish fiction, which is what I have been doing and will continue to do in this talk, please remain cognizant throughout that Jewish fiction and its authors are far from monolithic. Now to the stories. Here are the first four stories we will discuss. The ones originally written in Italian, Danish, Turkish, and Croatian. What you see here are snapshots taken from the page in jewishfiction.net where each story appears. Italian, purchase of goods of dubious origin by Augusto Segre, translated by Steve Siporin. This story is about a Jewish family in Italy set in the period of the second emancipation. The pater familias, Elia Levi, runs a successful metal business that he has inherited from his parents, but he has higher hopes for his son Giuseppe, the apple of his eye. And instead of bringing him into the family business, he sends him to university. Giuseppe is talented and after graduating in jurisprudence, he acquires a prestigious position in the judiciary as a magistrate's clerk. He is the first Jew to occupy such an important position in their small city and the family and the whole Jewish community rejoices in the great emancipation which has made this possible. Soon after this, Elia is approached by a merchant he doesn't know who offers to sell him metal at an exceptional price. Elia, Elia is dubious at first, uh, but as the paperwork works out, looks fine, he proceeds with the transaction. And then it turns out that these were stolen goods. Although Elia is known as an honest man in his town, the court has no choice but to rule against him and his business is ruined. Then at Giuseppe, his son's place of work, this court ruling is used against him and it begins to affect his reputation. It's obvious this mistake of his father's is going to ruin his career. He is close to his father and comes to visit him and asks how he could have made such an error of judgment. His father explains what happened. He was just taken in by a crook. Giuseppe goes away and commits suicide. The theme of this sad story is anti-Semitism and the limited and illusory nature of the freedoms granted to Jews in the emancipation. Danish, A Place Nowhere by Birte Kant, translated by Nina Sokol. This novel excerpt told in the first person begins with a non-Jewish Danish history teacher teaching his high school class a lesson in Jewish history. For the only Jewish girl in the class, this is the first Jewish history she's ever heard. She's shocked to hear about pogroms, the Holocaust, and the escape during the Holocaust of Danish Jews to Sweden. After class, her teacher talks to her kindly and says he can't imagine parents who would allow their child to grow up outside of history. That night, the girl tries to raise the subject at home but gets nowhere with her parents. So she sneaks out to visit someone who knows about her parents' past but whom she's forbidden to visit. She learns from this woman that her parents were among those who escaped to Sweden during the war and that they were lucky because not everyone they knew managed to escape. When she gets home, her mother has guessed who she's been visiting and forbids her to ever go there again. But the girl is committed to going back until she has the whole story. She and her mother have an argument which ends with the girl in the bathroom planning to smash or perhaps even smashing, it's not clear the bathroom mirror. The theme, the Holocaust, but more precisely, the silence around the Holocaust and the price of trying to hide a secret past from one's children and the costs of this to the familial relationships and trust. Turkish, where were you, where were you when darkness fell by Mario Levy, translated by Leila Tonga Pasmaci. This novel excerpt is about a man named Isaac struggling to reconcile his identity as Turkish with his identity as a Jew. 
He's very proud of being Turkish, even though as a Jew, he is treated as an outsider. And at school, he was demeaned for being Jewish. At home, he has a father who always says to him, you are going to be nothing but a scoundrel and a mother who wants him to marry a local Jewish girl, which he does not want to do. He also feels estranged from his grandmother and has contempt for her because she speaks only Ladino and not Turkish. Isaac becomes a lost soul, squandering the money his parents saved for him and wandering aimlessly around England. Eventually he comes home and works in his father's shop. And then when his father dies, he takes it over. He's not at all sad when his father dies. He's just bitter about him. But after the Shiva, he falls apart sobbing. In the final section of this excerpt, Isaac speaks appreciatively and warmly about his Jewish relatives and his father's Jewish friends, whom he previously regarded with disdain, and he finds some level of peace within himself. Themes, father-son conflict, an identity conflict between being Jewish and Turkish, and how these two conflicts interact because for Isaac, his disapproving father is a symbol of Jewishness. Croatian, Purimspiel by Jasminka Domas, translated by Iskra Pavlovi. This is a Purim story, obviously. And one of the joys of JewishFiction.net is publishing stories prior to each Jewish holiday about that holiday. This story is about a young Croatian writer named Tamar, who dresses up in a sari and Indian jewelry as her Purim costume, and then on the way to a Purim party with her friends, disappears without a trace. The local newspaper announces, Tamar Sonnenschein has mysteriously disappeared on her way to a Purim party. If you have some news about her, contact the nearest police station. At the same time, on the other side of the world, the local papers in India report that in an ashram, a mysterious white woman in a sari has appeared, speaking a strange language nobody understands. The people there ask her if she knows how to do anything, so she goes to the kitchen and bakes 10 trays of hamantashen, which everyone loves. Up in heaven, God scolds the archangel Michael, asking him why on Purim in 2011, he has put Tamar, instead of at a Purim party in Croatia, at the Feast of Diwali in India. Michael defends himself saying, didn't you say I could have an extra glass on Purim? The angel Gabriel, who's been listening to this, consoles Michael by saying, well, if nothing else, at least she was properly dressed. Then God returns Tamar to Croatia. Some serious themes in this lighthearted Purim spiel, the fluidity of time and space for Jews, ein mukdam u wuchar Torah, there's no time either of before or after in the Torah, the magical power of Purim, and of Jewish holidays, and the idea that God is always near us and our destiny is in God's hands. Now here are the next four stories translated from Serbian, German, Hungarian, and Ladino. Serbian, Encounter, a conversation between two converts by Gordana Kuik, translated by Kristina Pribicevic. This novel excerpt is set at the beginning of the 16th century in Istanbul, then part of the Ottoman Empire. Late one evening, there's a loud, sharp rapping at the door, and Solomon, the father of the house, goes to answer it. His ancestors were Jewish, but converted to Christianity, and at this point, he has reconverted back to Judaism. Standing at his front door is his employer and friend, Orlu Pasha who as a boy was forcibly converted from Christianity to Islam. Solomon invites him in and Orlu Pasha confides to him that sometimes he feels torn between Islam and Christianity. Solomon confides back that even when he was a Christian, at times he secretly prayed as a Jew. They also discuss the turbulent political events rocking their city, which worry Orlu Pasha. They speak with total frankness and then are interrupted by an argument between a husband and wife outside Solomon's gate. Solomon goes to deal with it, and Orlu Pasha, for the first time, 
sees Solomon's daughter Luna, who is standing by the fountain. He goes over and speaks to her, and they instantly fall in love. Themes, interfaith understanding and friendship, and interfaith romantic love. German, New York, by Peter Sitrovsky, translated by John Howard. It's 1995 and an old couple, Eric and Hannah, originally from Vienna, are living in Brooklyn, New York. He's 78, she's 73. They've been in New York for decades and they're both retired. Eric previously worked as an editor in a publishing house and was responsible for German language literature. Hannah translated books from German into English. Tonight, there's a reception at the Austrian embassy that they've been invited to on the occasion of the 50th anniversary of the end of the war. They go back and forth, unable to decide whether or not to go. Meanwhile, they start revisiting the past, the time when they hid during the war for two years in a basement. They wonder why they survived when so many others did not and conclude that they survived for their son, but their son is no longer alive. They also talk about how after the war, they looked like an old man and an old woman, but here in New York, they became beautiful again. Eric says, on the outside, maybe, but here in my stomach, the rat from the basement is still gnawing. Then he looks at his watch and realizes they've missed the buffet at the embassy. Themes, the Holocaust, the long arm of memory and trauma, and how it's never really over. Also, how the loss of a child affects one's sense of the meaning of life. Hungarian, The First Christmas by Gabor T. Chantel, translated by Walter Burgess and Marietta Mori. It's 1969 in Hungary, and in a Jewish family, the father of two boys is being pressured by them to buy a Christmas tree. His wife leaves the decision up to him and he gives in to his boys. He's never bought a Christmas tree before and now he goes to the market to buy one. Smelling the pine trees sends him back 25 years and he recalls the Christmas of 1944 when as part of a forced labor battalion, his work camp was near a snow covered forest. That Christmas, the Nazi soldiers supposedly as a Christmas present to the slave laborers, organized a race where only those who fell behind in the race would be killed. The rest would be spared. His friend fell behind in the race and was shot. Now he buys a Christmas tree and at home his family decorates it with candy and ornaments. He's also bought his son's gift of air rifles and they're very excited about the rifles and the tree. This Christmas tree stands in front of a window and beyond the window is an empty lot, which his wife and sons assume is where the boys will aim their rifles. The father loads tiny lead pellets into a rifle, hands it to his older son and says, we won't shoot the candy on the tree, only all the ornaments. The boy takes a step back in shock. His eyes search his mother's face and she is clenching her younger son with tears in her eyes. Theme, the Holocaust. And again, it's legacy years later. And in this story, it's legacy into the next generation. Ladino or Judeo-Spanish. The Washerwoman's Daughter by Elia Carmona, translated by Michael Alpert. This story begins with a young woman, Leontine, complaining to her brother, Merovac, who is a criminal, that he took all of her inheritance from their father. He claims he used it to pay for her dowry so she could marry Armand, his accomplice in crime, who is a thief, a drunk, and who is in and out of prison all the time, and whom Merovac fixed up his sister with. One evening, Armand comes home with an abandoned baby he found on a bench. He presents it as a gift to Leontine, and when she removes the baby's swaddling clothes, she discovers an envelope that reads, to the person who rescues this child. The two men open the envelope and find a letter and 40,000 francs. 
The letter instructs the finder of the letter to care for the baby boy until he is 20, then to write to a certain address in Paris where the finders will be rewarded. Armand, please, says this is good. When he's 20 years old, if we're rich, we won't tell him. And if we're poor, it will be a good way of solving our problem. Last night, poverty was staring us in the face. Now that the master of the world has taken pity on us, we should eat and drink and praise his name. He sends Merovic to buy meat and wine and the three of them have a feast. Themes, immorality and criminality among Jews, including those who invoke God's name, also the personal and economic vulnerability of women in that society. Our next four stories were originally written in Polish, Romanian, Russian, and Spanish. Polish, Marek Lasko, Killing the Second Dog, translated by Tomasz Mirkowitz. This novel excerpt is set in Tel Aviv in the 1960s and reflects life there at that time. Told in the first person, it's about a young drifter from Poland, someone in and out of prison, living a marginal hand-to-mouth existence. He shares a Tel Aviv apartment with someone he met in a Tel Aviv prison, Robert, who also came to Israel from Poland. The narrator is a failure at everything he attempts. He loves Chekhov and wants to be an actor but can't figure out how. He worked in a building site but broke his arm so he couldn't keep working. He worked as a driving instructor for a woman but got fired because her husband suspected without basis they were having an affair. Then the same woman shows up at his apartment and tries to start an affair with him. But even this he feels he's not up to because the Israeli chamsim, the hot desert wind, makes him feel listless and everything seems so pointless to him. He asks Robert's advice and Robert advises him to just talk to the woman about sex, not to actually have sex with her. So that's what the narrator, that is what the narrator does until the end of this excerpt. Themes, criminality, immorality, Israeli life in the 60s, wandering, rootlessness, being lost, and not belonging anywhere. Romanian, bibliography by Radu Kosashu, translated by Jean Harris. This novel excerpt is a holiday story set on Pesach. Ben is a young Jewish revolutionary living with his parents who has contempt for them because in his eyes they are bourgeois. He is a passionate member of the Communist Youth League and believes fervently in the revolution, which his father opposes. Ben's non-Jewish girlfriend, Anna, shares his political views and he sneaks her into his room without his parents knowing almost every night. Whenever they meet, they talk all night in his room and then share just one kiss before she goes home. They believe in waiting to have sex till they are married. Now, on Erev Pesach, Ben sneaks Anna up to his room as usual, but this time his father, who has never met Anna before, sees them and assumes they are having sex. He is outraged at having his home defiled in this way, especially on Pesach, which is an insult to Judaism. He tells Ben that as of tomorrow, he has to leave the house. Ben's mother reacts differently, bringing Ben and Anna bowls of soup with black bread and it's the first time Ben has eaten bread at home on Pesach. Then Ben's grandfather comes upstairs to visit the young couple. He sees them sitting together chastely and he is friendly to Anna. And he says to Ben that he loves him and trusts him. After he leaves, Anna tells Ben that he shouldn't leave his parents home and should find a way to get along with them. She also says she thinks they're rushing too fast into marriage because her father said that. Her father has just come out of prison where he was incarcerated possibly for political reason. And she sees him and parents in general as worthy of respect and love. Themes, intergenerational conflict over politics, religion and conforming to communal norms. The intertwining of the personal and political, the replacing of Judaism with communism as the new religion, interfaith romance and intermarriage. Pesach and the meaning of freedom, and the role sometimes played by grandparents in helping to bridge parent-child differences. Russian, Red Cavalry, 
by Isaac Babel, translated in a new translation by Boris Dralyuk. Red Cavalry was, as you'll recall, Ruth Weiss's example of Jewish consciousness. The excerpt we published is comprised of three sections from Babel's stories told in the first per person based on his experiences with the Soviet Red Cavalry during the Polish-Soviet War. In the first excerpt, the narrator, a soldier, is billeted with a pregnant Jewish woman and two other Jews who are living in filth and poverty. He goes to sleep next to an old man, but in the middle of the night, the pregnant woman wakes him up, saying he's been screaming in his sleep and thrashing around, and he's disturbing the old man next to him, who is her father. She removes the blanket from her father, and it turns out he's dead and has been for a while after being brutally murdered by Poles. In the second excerpt, it's almost Friday night and the narrator reminiscing about the beautiful Shabbatot he experienced as a boy, visits the shop of a Jew named Gadali who sells miscellaneous items. They discuss politics and evil. Gadali says, which is the revolution and which the counter revolution? They don't seem very different to him. He also says, we know what the international is, and I want an international of good people. Then he tells the narrator, the Sabbath is coming. Jews must go to the synagogue, and he does. In the third excerpt, after Gadali has been to shul, he takes the narrator to visit a local Rebbe, the last Rebbe of a dynasty. The room is stony and barren like a morgue, and the Rebbe sits at a table surrounded by, quote, liars and the bedeviled. It's a poor, sad, despondent place. The rabbi's youngest son is there smoking one cigarette after another, even though it's the Sabbath. The narrator speaks briefly with the Rebbe, eats a bit of supper, and returns to the agitprop train of the first cavalry army. Themes. The anti-Semitism experienced by Jews at the hands of both the Poles and the Russians, the lack of future for Jews in Russia, the sun being a symbol of that, the narrator's conflicting identities as both a Russian soldier and a Jew. Spanish, The Guest by Varda Fishbane, translated by Andrea G. Labinger. This is another Pesach story. The narrator is a 13-year-old girl and the setting is a satyr run by her grandfather. This year, there's a new guest at the family Seder, and this guest is the one who finds the Afikoman. In this family, quote, redemption of the Afikoman was governed by strict rules. No price limit, no refusal or bargaining was possible. The grandfather asks the guest what he wants in exchange for the Afikoman, and the guest replies, I want to marry your daughter. The grandfather cannot refuse, and three months later, the narrator's Aunt Raquel is married to this man. Themes, the patriarchal nature of Jewish tradition and the Jewish family. We have now reached the last quartet of the 16 stories, those translated from French, Yiddish, Hebrew, and English. French, Autobiography of No One by Esther Orner, translated by Talia Halkin. This is the story of a woman's life told in first person and not in any chronological order. She moved from Europe to Israel to be near her daughter, but her daughter didn't have time for her or even a place for her to stay. So the narrator stayed at first with various friends she knew, then moved out and then soon ran out of money. She never really learns Hebrew, even though she has a talent for languages because by the time she gets to Israel, quote, her head does not function properly any longer after all those blows. In Israel, she feels like an outsider, but doesn't leave because the country in Europe that she comes from, which she does not name, is now, quote, a dead place where even when they got rid of us, they continued to hate us. Growing up, her parents were religious, but after her father fought in the war, he came home without peyot. He'd become a modern man. The sign of his modernity, quote, one day he brought home some tomatoes. Mother wouldn't touch them. She had never seen the likes of a tomato. 
Her mother also wouldn't let her get a higher education, fearing that in the big city, her daughter might have to attend university classes on Shabbat. Themes, anti-Semitism, the limitations imposed on one's personal and professional development by religious observance, the experience of not belonging anywhere, not feeling at home even in the Jewish homeland, intergenerational conflict and disappointment, language and identity, violence against women, modernity, the erosion of religious belief following contact with the wider world. Yiddish, The Rebetzin Sense of Justice by Lily Berger, translated by Ronnie Yeager. This story is narrated by a girl who through a special arrangement between her mother and Rebetzin Chaye is allowed to study in a cheder in a shtetl classroom with the boys. This Rebetzin Chaya is married to the teacher of the Cheder, Reb Fischl. Reb Fischl is, quote, small, skinny, timid, with eyes always downcast. The Rebetzin is the opposite, big, full-bodied, a Jewish Cossack who tolerated no injustice. The Rebetzin never interferes with her husband's pedagogy, but on everything else, she rules. She decides about the fees each pupil has to pay. She forces her husband to let the children play outside once a day. And she is obsessed with justice and righteousness. One day, managing the lunches that each child brought, she sees that the orphan Fival has, as usual, brought only a dry crust of bread, whereas Yoina, the fat rich boy, has, as usual, brought a bag of all the best foods. So she gives Fival one of Yoina's two pairs. Yoina gets angry, tells his parents, and the next day his mother, the butcher's wife, marches into the cheder to complain. The Rebetzin stands up to her, they argue, and the butcher's wife stalks off, threatening action. Reb Fischl is frightened and says to his wife that even in a rabbinical court, the butcher's wife will perhaps be found to be right. The Rebetzin replies, so let her take me to court. Am I afraid? Let her. I will prove to the rabbi that it is not according to law and not according to justice, that one should eat to the bursting point and another should starve. There must still be a bit of justice. The Rebbe went silently back to his place. It seems he understood that Big Chaya was prepared to stand not only before the law, before the rabbis, but even before God himself in order to demand that there should be some justice in the world. Themes, social justice, also power dynamics and accommodations within marriages. Before discussing the next story, the Hebrew one, a brief comment. Aside from English, the language we've published the most works from is Hebrew. To date, we have published 77 translations from Hebrew. And also, since we are now all together, virtually anyway, in Israel, at the National Library in Jerusalem, this is another reason to honor the Hebrew language. So here's a list of the Hebrew translations we have published so far in jewishfiction.net. And now to the Hebrew story we will be discussing. The Old Man Farewell by Noga Al-Balach, translated by Daniela, Daniela Zemir, with thanks to the Institute for the Translation of Hebrew Literature. This is a novel excerpt about the narrator's old father who is suffering from dementia. The characters are called only the old man, the old man's daughter, and the old man's wife. This excerpt focuses on the daughter's gradual understanding of what is happening to her father. For example, one day at her parents' apartment, she sees her father standing by the door, angry, wearing a black coat and black baseball cap, clutching a black plastic briefcase. Quote, he says he has to go see his wife, the old man's wife said. Her father came to Israel from Bulgaria and struggled at first with Hebrew when studying law. Now he forgets that he was a lawyer and remembers only that he was a construction worker as a young man, so he tells the social worker that this was his profession. They get a new helper for him who is Filipina and has left a young daughter behind in the Philippines. Quote, had the old man still been in full possession of his faculties, he probably would have said, Absolutely not. Leave a little girl behind and cross half the globe for my benefit? Under no circumstances. This young woman must return to her home in the Philippines at once. 
But since the old man was not in full possession of his faculties, his family members were free to go morally haywire and do as they please, end quote. Themes, the gradual loss of a parent through dementia, family issues and strains in the Israeli context, the moral complexity of hiring a caregiver from abroad, a daughter's guilt over not doing the caregiving herself. Last but not least, English, Another Cousin by Anne Burstein. Mona is a rich, successful businesswoman in the upscale fashion industry in New York. One morning, a short, handsome, seedily dressed young man with an accent shows up in her office, claiming to be her cousin from Romania. Mona knows nothing about her family from over there. Her parents left that world behind, lost many relatives during the war, and never wanted to talk about them. Mona has no idea if this man is really related to her or if this is a scam, especially when he asked for a designer job in her company because he was a tailor in Romania, as if a tailor would be good enough for a designer in her company. She sends him to personnel to fill out a job application, but then feels guilty and invites him to her family's Thanksgiving dinner. A few hours later, she meets two of her cousins for lunch at the old deli where her father and his brothers once hung out when they were all tailors together. There's a long-standing tension between her two cousins and added to this, one of them wants to sell the family country house in the Catskills. Mona has happy, maybe idealized memories of that place, summers spent with her grandparents and all the cousins together. She also feels sentimental about this deli and about the early days of Jewish immigrant life. But when someone who in many ways like her Taylor father and his brothers shows up on her doorstep from Romania, it's a different story. Themes, the intersections of the past and present, assimilation and its costs, the sense that with success and assimilation, something has been lost class issues among Jews, embarrassment at possibly being associated with a poor immigrant, guilt about the family left behind in Europe, the question of responsibility for extended family, including those you don't even know, what does one owe such relatives? That's the end of our whirlwind tour through these 16 stories. Here for your reference are the 16 stories I just mentioned in case you want to screen save this list so you can look them up later for yourselves. As you have seen, there's great diversity among these stories, but also there are some common themes. One obvious one is anti-Semitism. This is evident across different time periods and locations. For example, in the Italian story regarding the false promises of the emancipation, and in the Russian story where anti-Semitism presages the lack of a future for the Jews in Russia. The Danish, Hungarian and German stories deal with the anti-Semitism as manifested in the Holocaust. And in two additional stories, the French and the English ones, the Holocaust is not explicitly mentioned, yet its shadow lurks in the corners of the stories, both in content and tone. A second theme in the 16 stories is the Jewish family in all its complexity. In some of these stories, there's great love between parents and their children, as in the Italian story where the father adores his son Giuseppe, and in the Hebrew one where the daughter adores and is heartbroken over her aging father with dementia. There is also conflict between the generations, where children feel their parents don't understand or appreciate them. And as a result, there's alienation between child and parent, as in the Danish, Turkish, and Romanian stories. In these stories, the intergenerational conflicts can be over Jewish identity, religious observance, politics, ideology, or not conforming to community norms and behaviors. Sometimes the source of conflict is a combination of all the above, like in the Romanian story with Ben violating his family's Pesach practices because he has adopted the revolution as his new religion and also plans to marry a non-Jewish girlfriend. There can be intergenerational conflict and disappointment in the other direction as well. For instance, in the French story where the mother moves to Israel to be near her daughter and is hurt by her inattention and indifference. 
All these dynamics occur in these stories within the nuclear family. But the extended family is a topic here too in the English story, which explores the fraught emotions and obligations within that broader family unit. In some of the stories written by women, there's also a feminist theme, highlighting and critiquing the sexist or patriarchal elements in the Jewish family, Jewish tradition, or both. In the Spanish story, a father exchanges his daughter for the Afrikoman. In the French one, the narrator is deprived of a university education because of her family's perceptions of the demands of religious observance. observance. Also part of the family theme, there are some interesting marriages in these 16 stories. For example, in the Yiddish story, the Rebetzin is described as a Jewish Cossack and the Rebbe is small, timid, with eyes always downcast. The Rebetzin is a strong and powerful woman who is without doubt her husband's equal in this marriage. Very different is the marriage in the Ladino story, which begins with the bride's crooked brother stealing her inheritance from their father and passing it over to his criminal accomplice, her future husband, supposedly as a dowry. In this marriage, an honest woman is trapped in a criminal lifestyle, part of a triangle with her brother and husband, which she is powerless to escape. This Ladino story leads us to a third theme in these 16 stories, that of morality and immorality. The Ladino story describes a family of criminals who are Jewish, and the Polish story describes life among Jewish and non-Jewish crooks working together. The flip side of these tales of immorality are the stories that are concerned with morality. The Ladino story reflects, alongside the immorality of the men, the moral innocence of Leontine. In the Hebrew story, the narrator daughter is troubled by the moral complexity of hiring a Filipina caregiver who's had to abandon her own child in order to care for the narrator's father. And the daughter knows that if her father were not experiencing dementia, he would be troubled by this too. Last but not least on the morality theme is the Yiddish story where the Rebetzin obsessed with justice refuses to conform either to accepted social norms or her community's pecking order, believing that what she is doing is what God would want her to. To me, it is very intriguing that the three stories out of the 16 where morality is a key theme are written in Ladino, Hebrew, and Yiddish, all Jewish languages. Perhaps this is coincidence, perhaps not. The fourth theme that stands out in some of these stories is the feeling the characters have that they are outsiders in the countries in which they live, the sense that they don't really belong there because they are Jews. In the French story, this is explicitly stated. In the Russian and Turkish stories, the feeling of not belonging is also part of a conflict for the characters between two different identities. In the Russian story, the conflict is between being Jewish and a Russian soldier. In the Turkish story, it is between being Jewish and Turkish. In the latter, Isaac tries to be as Turkish as possible by fleeing his Jewish identity and holding in contempt everything that is Jewish, including the Ladino language. In happy contrast, the fifth theme in these stories is pride in one's Jewish identity and a love for and rejoicing in Jewish customs, traditions, and holidays. For example, in the Croatian story, there is delight associated with the holiday of Purim and a sense that it has almost magical power, the capacity to spiritually uplift and transform us by, by uniting us with all Jews across time and space, as well as with God. And even in other stories where the attitude toward Judaism is more ambivalent, Jewish holidays are recognized as significant and as moments of special symbolic power. In the Spanish story, for instance, this one Pesach Seder changes the life not only of the aunt who gets married off then, but also that of the 13-year-old girl who observes all this. And in the Romanian story, Ben, the non-believer, out of all the days in the year, picks Pesach, the festival of freedom, to assert his freedom from his family and their beliefs. The sixth and last theme I'll mention is positive relationships between Jews and non-Jews. I started this discussion of themes with the first one being anti-Semitism as experienced by Jews at the hands of non-Jews. 
Now we'll end our discussion of themes with the positive relationships between Jews and non-Jews. In the Serbian story, Solomon and Orlu Pasha are very close friends. On extremely delicate matters where they are both vulnerable personally and politically, they are able to speak to each other, quote, with total frankness. It's a lovely picture of interfaith friendship. Then Solomon's daughter Luna takes interfaith friendship one step further, falling in love with Orlu Pasha. And in the Romanian story, Ben the Jew and Anna the Christian are passionately in love and planning to marry. Reflected in these stories is the appreciation of, maybe even the longing for, positive relationships with our non-Jewish friends and neighbors. And at the same time, there's the question of what limits, if any, should be placed on interfaith intimacy in the interest of preserving our own tradition. Of course, there are many other themes and sub-themes that could be drawn from these stories, like water from a well, but I will stop here. And I'm not saying obviously that the six themes I just identified, anti-Semitism, the Jewish family, morality, outsider identity, pride in and love of Jewish tradition, and positive relationships with non-Jews are in any way definitive ones in Jewish fiction. But I think they summarize in a meaningful way some major Jewish concerns and preoccupations. And as such, they are reflective of what Ruth Weiss called Jewish experience, Jewish consciousness, and the Jewish condition. Now a brief comment about the relationship between Jewish fiction and real life. On the one hand, a story reveals something highly individual about a particular author and his or her inner life and intimate experience of the world. On the other hand, as we've just seen with these 16 stories, a group of fictional works taken together can reflect some sort of collective consciousness or something about larger societal realities and trends. To offer an example about the relationship between Jewish fiction and real life that I encountered through jewishfiction.net, a few years after starting this journal, I noticed that we were publishing a surprising number of stories about mikvahs. Curious, I examined these stories as a group and discovered that out of the eight mikvah themed stories that we had published till then, six of them, that's three quarters, had ended in what I termed mikvah suicides. In other words, women drowning themselves, committing suicide in a mikvah. For instance, in the story Total Immersion, Gloria, a young Orthodox woman, gets pressured into marrying a man twice her age who physically repulses her. After three months of beatings, forced sex, and being refused a divorce, she commits suicide by drowning herself in a mikvah. The other five stories in this group of six end in the same way. I was shocked to see this, especially since this phenomenon was one I had never heard of in real life. Now, obviously, literature is not a direct reflection of real life, and the kind of knowledge one gains through literature is different from the kind acquired, say, through social science research, which I used to conduct. But fiction does provide important information and valuable knowledge, and it seemed to me unlikely that it was just coincidental and meaningless that at jewishfiction.net we'd gotten story after story about women trapped in abusive marital situations who considered a mikvah suicide as their only way out. This seemed to reflect some aspect of a collective experience. I won't delve here into the various possible meanings of mikvah suicides. If you're interested, I wrote a blog on this topic, which was published in Haaretz and then in the foreword, and which you can read on my website at noragold.com. I mention this phenomenon of mikvah suicide stories only as an example of how Jewish fiction might reflect and offer some key insights into real life. And it's interesting that not long after I noticed this pattern, the mikvah became front page news throughout the Jewish world due to the Barry Frundell scandal, when this Washington rabbi placed a hidden camera in a mikvah to film the naked women converts there. Then after that, there was yet another convergence between real life and these six mikvah stories. I was invited to give a talk during the intermission of a play that was going to be performed in Toronto. This play was called Mikveh, and it was an Israeli work by Hadar Galron that had been translated from Hebrew into English. So to prepare for my talk, I read this play and guess how it ended? In a mikvah suicide. 
On a happier note, though, I must say there have been other stories in JewishFiction.net about mikvahs that are very positive in tone. For instance, there are two beautiful stories set in mikvahs, one called Ritual Bath and the other, Manya's story, which portray an admiring, even grateful perspective on the mikvah. In each of these stories, the female attendant in the mikvah helps a vulnerable young woman in distress, one struggling with a history of incest, the other with sexual problems in her marriage. So this is just one example of how fiction can act as a reflection of real lives. That said, it's important to remember that the relationship between fiction and reality can be a very complex one. Fiction is not, as some people think, just autobiography in disguise. However, fiction is a place where writers can try out new ideas, solutions, and alternatives to their lives, which sometimes they cannot or dare not explore in reality. So literature can be not only descriptive, but aspirational, a place to sketch out and flesh out one's hopes and dreams. It can also be a place to say the unsayable. So in this sense, writing fiction can be a subversive act. I think that fiction as a genre has a special power because when you read a story or a novel, you enter into the inner life of the main character. Even if this protagonist is a serial killer, once you decide to keep reading that book, you enter his reality and see the world through his eyes. So reading fiction introduces you to a different kind of person than you would normally meet, as well as to places, cultures, and experiences distant from your own. What literary fiction does is bring us into intimate contact with differentness and otherness, and it therefore increases our capacity for empathy and tolerance. There is research actually, for example, by Keith Oatley and Raymond Marr, among others, showing that when you read good fiction, it changes you emotionally and even neurologically. So fiction changes people, and if it changes people, it can also perhaps in some small way change the world and be a form of tikkun olam. Regarding jewishfiction.net, for instance, I have received countless emails from readers saying that until a, a certain issue, our latest issue at the time, they had never before read a story by an Argentinian Jew or a Serbian Jew or a Turkish Jew or whatever, and had never thought about these Jews particular perspective or experience of life. And this had made them think more deeply about what it means to be Jewish, and it had broadened the parameters of the Jewish world as they knew it. So it is my hope that JewishFiction.net and Jewish fiction in general can help bring the Jewish people closer together and make us more knowledgeable, more knowledgeable about and accepting of each other in all our diversity. I hope you've enjoyed this journey into JewishFiction.net and Jewish fiction. And I look forward to meeting you soon at jewishfiction.net. And I wish you many hours of reading pleasure as you explore the rich, diverse, beautiful, and imaginative stories there of our people. Thank you very, very much, Dr. Gold. Uh, there are many compliments in the chat and I will send you the transcript so that you can read them yourself. You. Um, there are many questions as well. I'll try to... Uh, uh, ask the best, and I apologize for those uh, who are, that uh, I'm going to skip their questions um, in advance, but there will be an opportunity at the end to ask your own questions if you'd like to. Um, so I'll begin in a question about your opening remarks. Um, is there any book or story that stood out in your decision to include it or not? Uh, what were the considerations and what did you ultimately decide about it? Is, it, is the question about the 16 stories I just referred to or any story? Any, any, story? any story, yeah, that, you, you, that, that stood out to you um, in your eyes uh, about the decision-making process and, and accepting it or not accepting it as Jewish fiction. I think of one story in particular um, that opened the whole question of Israeli fiction, because there, there are many stories, we published 77 <laughs> stories translated from Hebrew. And some of them, if they were not set in Israel, 
might not make the cut for us. So for example, a love story, you know, to use the example that I gave before, someone walking down the street thinking about a failed romance. Um, is it a Jewish story if the person is walking down Dizengoff Street in Tel Aviv eating a falafel? Does, you know, does that make it a Jewish story? Um, I don't think necessarily it does. Uh, one could make the argument that like Song of Songs, which, you know, it's not, it's not an erotic love story, love poem. It's really an allegory about the relationship of the Jewish people and God. One could take any Israeli story and say, well, it's about Jewish life in the Jewish state. But uh, I am not casual about that. And the Israeli stories that we pick are reflective of something that to us uh, contains elements of Jewish history, culture, uh, awareness of one's Jewish self. I mean, if we come back to the, the point that Ruth Weiss made about Jewish fiction is fiction where either the author or the characters know that they are Jews, um, that comes through pretty clearly, not just that they're Israeli, but they're Jewish. This comes through pretty clearly in most of the Israeli stories or for the most part novel excerpts that we consider. But I remember one particular uh, Israeli story that uh, I chose to turn down even though I really liked it very much um, because there really wasn't any, any way for me to justify that as Jewish fiction. So I would say the, the uh, Israeli stories pose a particular challenge, but a challenge we take seriously and and we discuss seriously amongst ourselves. Thank you very much. There are two questions by the audience that I will group together uh, in, the, in contrary to what I uh, po uh, promised you. Um, but uh, you, um, it basically, um, it continues the question that you've just answered. So Gladwin asked, uh, can non-Jewish people write Jewish fiction? Could you give us some good examples? And Nomi uh, Waxberg asked, uh, would you consider Jewish literature if it was written by someone who had a Jewish soul, but was not Jewish themselves? I'm thinking of William Styron, uh, Sophie's Choice, as one example of many others. Mm -hmm. Certainly. And in fact, one of the 16 stories that I just told you was written by a non-Jew. The Polish story by Mara Klasko, Killing the Second Dog. He is a non-Jewish Polish drifter who ends up in Tel Aviv. And it's a Jewish story from our point of view because it is fully about the criminal underworld of Israel in the 1960s. That's exactly what it's about. And it's about uh, relationships between Jews and non-Jews in that very specific time and place. Um, the first, yeah, I, I actually, uh, there's so much I wanted to say that in my talk that I, I almost didn't, but I slid it in. You may have, it may have gone by quickly when I said that, you know, authorship is not enough for Jewish fiction and that non, you don't have to be Jewish to write Jewish fiction. So that's one example. I remember the first time we accepted a story by a non-Jewish writer and it was a Holocaust story and it was beautiful. And there was no reason not to accept it. It was, um, tone perfect. It, there, I mean, we, we obviously have many submissions by Jews and non-Jews. Uh, and uh, I should say, and this, I didn't say this again, in the interest of time, I left out many things that I perhaps could have said. Uh, all these stories we, we receive, um, we read with anonymous review. You no longer say blind review, you say anonymous review. No one knows, including me, who wrote it when we are reading it. We don't know the name of the person, the gender of the person, or the religion of the person, and that has no bearing on the decision at all. Uh, we have actually turned down uh, stories uh, some, from some very famous people, <laughs> but uh, we figure that uh, our integrity and what we believe is quality is the essential variable and we don't compromise on that. Thank you very, very much. Um, 
You're not only the founder and editor of JewishFiction.net, but uh, you're also a writer. Can you tell us something about your own books? Uh, what sort um, uh, what sort of themes do you write about? What, what kind of books do you write? Thank you. Thank you for asking. Well, my first book, uh, I actually, um, my first book was Marrow and Other Stories, was a collection of stories in a novella that dealt with many themes. And actually, I hadn't really thought about them uh, in terms of the themes that I just laid out. But actually, all those six themes that we discussed are, in, are all in that book, anti-Semitism, the Jewish family, morality, outsider identity, pride in and love of Jewish tradition, positive relationship with non jews all that is in there. Also, Israel figures pre very prominently in all my books. The title story of Marrow and other stories is set in Jerusalem during the first intifada. Fields of Exile, as you've heard, is about anti-Semitism and anti-Israelism on campus. And my third book, um, the novel, The Dead Man, or Ha'ish Hamet in Hebrew, when it came out in Hebrew, is set in Israel, primarily in Jerusalem, and it's about love of music and love of Israel as played out through a romantic relationship. Um, I've completed two more short novels not yet published. The first one, my fourth book, will come out next spring. It's set on Yom Kippur and involves a strange cast of characters, a random group of people who are thrown together during Neila when a crisis occurs during the service. My fifth book is about sickness and health. And no, it is not about the coronavirus. Uh, I had started and finished it before I'd ever even heard that word. And in any case, um, In Sickness and in Health, which is the title of the book, is not so much about the physical aspects of illness. Rather, it explores illness as an existential state. Um, it's also a story about keeping secrets about one's illness or disability and the impact this has on a marriage. Um, that book is now being considered by publishers and I should be hearing from them soon. But if anyone out there is a publisher who'd like to chat with me about this book, of course, uh, I'm open to all options. And um, if you want to find out more about all my books, my website is noragold.com. And you could also visit my author page on Facebook if you like. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, Sandy asked, is there a consideration for children's or young adults fiction within this group? No, we publish adult fiction. Um, it's quite remarkable to me how often we get um, we get submissions, poetry, plays, um, children's literature, uh, works of visual art, pieces of music, <laughs> and actually uh, uh, an Israeli colleague of mine, a wonderful poet, asked if she could start, uh, you know, jewishpoetry.net or something, and I offered to help her every way possible. She didn't get around to it. But uh, no, we draw the line at adult fiction. Thank you, Dr. Gold. Um, so um, someone, I'm trying to find their name. I'm sorry. Oh, here, Charlotte asked, could you please put up the list uh, once again? Uh, I assume she didn't um, manage to uh, capture the screen in time. And also, um, Sandy asked, are each of these 16 stories, uh, each short stories or full novel of fiction? Um, e some of these are novel excerpts. Some of them are stories. Um, if you want to locate them easily, what you do is you go to the jewishfiction.net website, you put in a an email address and password, and then you have access to everything. And in the list of archives, you can just search the title and it'll pop right up. Um, and there you will see whether it's a novel excerpt or a story. It's actually, there's a whole thing <laughs> about stories versus novel excerpts. The accepted view by many is that novel excerpts are not as much fun to read as stories because they're not a completely contained unit. Um, 
when we pick a novel excerpt, and they're very hard to pick for this reason, we select sections that stand independently on their own, um, where you don't have to constantly like footnote explaining who is who is Shoshana and who is this person and they are cousins. So it's actually a fair bit of work, but it, it's well worth it. And and uh, we publish many novel excerpts and they're they're wonderful. They really like uh, stories unto themselves. Thank you very much. Um, so Julie asks, uh, first of all, she thanks you for a great presentation. And she says, curious, curious if you see a difference thematically between stories you've published by Israeli authors and the authors from outside of Israel, specifically regarding anti-Semitism. Is it less prevalent in these stories uh, by Israeli authors? It's an interesting question. Um, I'm thinking right now of an Israeli author, uh, Edna Shemesh, whose work uh, is Holocaust related. Um, I wouldn't say I wouldn't say anti-Semitism is absent from the Israeli stories, and I, I couldn't answer that story that that question seriously without a great deal of thought. I mean, actually lining them up and, and thinking deeply about their themes. But um, I was struck when I was presenting these 16 stories, uh, for example, that some of them were back to back. It was a random order in which I presented them. And, you know, the German and the Hungarian are both Holocaust stories and they were back to back and that, that felt sort of heavy. Um, but I wouldn't, so, so, you know, I had this sort of immediate flash of maybe the European stories are more conscious of anti-Semitism or Holocaust oriented, but that's certainly not true. The English language stories, all of the stories we get are, are heavily aware of Jewish history, which including it's not happy parts. I would not say that the Israeli writers uh, show no evidence of anti-Semitism, but off the bat, I wouldn't say that that is a dominant theme. That's as far as I could go with a quick kind of reply. Thank you very much. There are several authors here in our audience, uh, so hello to all. And uh, there are all kinds of questions uh, uh, regarding uh, uh, building a relationship with uh, um, Jewish fiction. Uh, but Randy asks, how, how, do, how would one submit content to the JewishFiction.net? You go to our website and you click on submissions and there's a submissions portal and we actually make the process extremely easy. You, um, you type in your name, you type in the title and you attach the document. You tick a box that says this has never before been, pre been published in English. Obviously, if it's a translation from another language, it's fine that it was published in Polish, but the translation in English could not have previously been published. Um, and there's a little box in case you want to say something about yourself, but the whole process takes probably about five minutes. And we welcome every submission and we take them very, very seriously. We, every submission gets read by at least two people. Um, and uh, I have the deciding vote. I make final decisions, but um, our reviewers are very, thoughtful and deep readers, and you will get a very fair hearing, a very serious reading of your work. So please send us your stuff. Thank you very much. Once again, I apologize to the people that I skipped their questions, but we have time for just one more. So um, jewishfiction.net is wonderful, uh, is a wonderful and important uh, cultural project. What can people do to support JewishFiction.net so it continues to be so for years to come? Well, um, thank you. Great question. Um, as I mentioned earlier, at JewishFiction.net, we rely 100% on donations in order to continue our work. And no donation is too small. Actually, we have a donor who gives $3 every month, and we really appreciate it. We appreciate every donation we receive. 
Uh, we also provide tax receipts for all American and Canadian donations. You just go to the donate button on our website at www.jewishfiction.net. And I think the link to our donate page may even be here in the chat box. Um, another way you can support jewishfiction.net is by telling your friends about us. Uh, we do have readers in 140 countries, but we're always looking to get the word out more and uh, word of mouth is the best possible way. Uh, last but not least, uh, if you know of any Jewish themed fiction that is being translated into English from other languages, which has not yet been published in English, uh, I would really welcome being connected with that translator or author. Uh, you can write to me through jewishfiction.net or my email is nora.gold at jewishfiction.net. And of course, to everyone who submits their work to us, uh, we are very grateful. Um, you're a big part of, you're essential part of what we do. Thank you so, so much once more, Dr. Gold. Um, thank you all for being here from all over the world. It was a pleasure seeing everyone here. Uh, and I will open microphones uh, for the audience so that you can thank Dr. Nora Gold in person or ask any other questions that you may have. Thank you, Dr. Nora Gold once more. And thank you, Nomi Schachter and uh, Laila Tov from Jerusalem. And I would like to thank you for, again for this wonderful opportunity to talk about these things with such a wonderful audience and very grateful to the National Library of Israel. Thank you very much. The microphones are open. Thank you so much for that fascinating talk. It really, um... I, I, I um, particularly appreciated the opening about Jewish fiction, about being very um, kind of unapologetic of what you mean by it, because it's a, you know, it's a complex topic. Uh, and on some level, you have the, uh, in this case, this is what you're doing. And so it, it, it's not a judgment call. This is... A Jewish fiction site, you know, as compared to the classic is, you know, Philip Roth, a Jewish author, you know. <laughs> Thank you so much. Can you mention uh, again or post a link for uh, Ruth, what you've been talking about, about Ruth Weiss's article or book? Which, which the book that I referred to from Ruth yes. Weiss is called The Jewish Canon, C A N O N. It, she published it in 2000 and it's widely available. It's a real classic. Say the name again, please. The Jewish Canon, C-A-N-O-N. -N. Thank you. Hello, can I ask a question? Yes, hi, Nora. Um, you know, it's wonderful that you've done a great service for uh, Jewish uh, fiction writers, uh, you know, sort of a category created over the last Few centuries and um, you know partly due to the English language and literature spreading that way but how would you put uh, a Jewish fiction in terms of location and history like roughly would you would you call that a phenomenon of the last few hundred years throughout the diaspora or does that question make sense to you but there have always been Jewish stories, right? And whenever there were Jewish stories, Jewish stories, one could, whether or not that's fiction and how one defines fiction, that's a whole other thing. But there's always been Jewish literature uh, as long as there are Jews. And, you know, if you, obviously Yiddish literature goes way back, but all of, I mean, always, always, there's been Jewish literature as long as there's been Jews. So that would include like Agadah and uh, parables and folk stories that would go around Jewish communities right back to our origin, more or less. I don't want to make it. <laughs> well, I won't take any of your time here. Okay, thank you. Yeah. I don't know if what I said was heard. I said that's... A, that's um, I'm not sure if I would make a case for those as fiction, but that's a much longer conversation. 
that we can't really have here, unfortunately, but it's a very interesting point that you raise. Uh, may Anybody? I ask the question? Thank you. Oh, sorry. I, I'm, Thank you. Gonna, uh, I'm sorry, I was going to ask um, uh, Nora, if, uh, um, first of all, your publication is wonderful. Um, do you have uh, any time soon, would you reopen uh, uh, the submissions to people who've already submitted or have been accepted? Yes, at, at present we have a policy of not publishing any writer more than once. And the reason for that is that there, without sounding immodest, there really isn't anything else like us. So when we publish someone, in fact, this just happened, I just accepted a story from someone and we went through the editing process. And the next day I got an email, here's another story. And the goal is really to make space for Jewish writers who are not yet well known um, and not to just keep publishing a select few over and over again. So it's very hard. But um, if you write to me, if you write to me and, you know, uh, occasionally there's an exception after four or five years or something, but write to me and we can. We can okay, see. thank you. I see a writer here, Birte Kant, who is the author of the Danish story is here and I'm very honored. I've never met you, Birta. What a pleasure. Thank you for being here. And I think also uh, Steve Siporin is here or was here and he's the translator of the um, Italian story, uh, the Segre story, Goods of Dubious Origin. And it's very exciting to, to meet the translators and authors for the first time. Yes, Norbert, you had a question? Yes, uh, here, uh, uh, Norbert, oh, yeah, uh, my uh, pseudonym is Jakob Matissen, and I'm actually also coming from Denmark. Um, so thank you very much. That was really a very nice uh, event. Uh, my question is, I have uh, written a novel uh, that has now been published in German about the pogroms in 1096 in Germany, so the first organized pogroms. And I wonder whether, so this is published in German, uh, whether uh, it would be a possibility to publish that in JewishFiction.net, uh, uh, but also whether you would see this as a possible way of finding an, a publisher. And of course, I would only uh, uh, send in the beginning of the, uh, of the novel. Would that be a way to get in contact with, with English publisher, or with publishers that publish in English uh, and that address Jewish people? Good question. Um, unfortunately, we don't have the capacity to do or commission translations ourselves. So the only yeah, I, I, I would do the translation, of course. Yeah, yeah well, yeah. certainly. What we would be very happy to consider an excerpt from your book. Mm -hmm. What we have found in the past, and part of what's exciting about working uh, with translations, is that when we publish an excerpt of someone's forthcoming novel. Say you, say you found a publisher and your book was going to come out in a year in English for the first time. We would time publication of the excerpt of your novel to be about a month before, which would help give worldwide publicity to the book in English. Yeah. Even if you don't have a publisher, we, we would be very excited to look, to look at the translation. So please do send it. It's great. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Nora Gold, once more. Uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, hope to see you in our next events, and Laila Tov from Jerusalem. Thank you, Daron, for your excellent managing of this event. Thank you very much. Laila Tov. Laila Tov. <laughs>